This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during November. In this episode, you'll get in sync with the moon's phases, watch the sky for all five bright planets, get the lowdown on the celestial queen, and get ready for three meteor showers. So grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. First, here's a quick reminder that almost all of the United States and Canada returns to Standard Time on Sunday, November 3rd. You know, fall back and all that. Now on to the celestial highlights. The moon's phases are closely in sync with the calendar this month, and so keeping track of them will be a snap. We start November with a new moon on the 1st. Watch the western evening sky a few days later for a thin crescent to emerge low in the southwest. First quarter follows on the night of November 8th, and the full beaver moon follows on the 15th. Last quarter is November 22nd, and we cycle back to new moon on the night of the 30th. That brilliant full moon on the 15th will be hiding something. Nearly hidden within its light will be the Pleiades star cluster. By eye, you'll have no chance of picking out any of the cluster's glittering stars, but you might see a few using binoculars and many more with a small telescope. From many locations in North America, the moon will actually cover up some of these Pleiades. That will happen late on the 15th on the West Coast and in the early hours of the 16th on the East Coast. More obvious will be the moon's cover-up of the bright star Spica before dawn on November 27th, and this time the lunar phase will be a thin crescent. If you're in the eastern half of North America, you can watch both the star's disappearance along the crescent's bright edge and its reappearance from the edge on the dark side roughly an hour later. Those as far west as Denver can still see the star's reappearance shortly after moonrise. Very exciting stuff. November will be one of those months where you have a chance to see all five bright planets, though not all at once. Let's start over in the southwest after sunset. Venus has been lurking low in the evening twilight ever since June, but this month it starts to climb higher and hangs around longer. As November opens, this brilliant evening star sets two hours after sunset, but that stretches to more than three hours by month's end. Now, by mid-November, Venus will be joined by Mercury, but spotting this fast-moving planet will be a challenge you'll need a viewing location that's completely unobstructed toward west. Start looking 30 to 45 minutes after sunset. Find Venus, and then look to its lower right by about twice the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length. Mercury will be hovering just a few degrees above the horizon. Don't wait too long, or it'll sink from view. Your best window will be the days before and after November 19th. Planet number three is Saturn. Make a quarter turn to your left so that you're facing south, and look about halfway from the horizon to overhead. Saturn isn't stunningly bright like Venus, but it is by itself in that part of the sky and pretty easy to spot. If you're having trouble spotting Saturn, then circle November 10th on your calendar. That night, the waxing gibbous moon passes just one degree below it. Now make another quarter turn to the left to face east. Brilliant Jupiter will be nearing its opposition opposite the sun in the sky early next month. But for now, it rises by about 8 p.m. early in November and by 6 p.m. late this month. You won't have any difficulty realizing that you've spotted Jupiter. It's not as bright as Venus, but it does outshine every star in the night sky by a lot. To spot planet number five, note where Jupiter is in the sky and look at that same location about three hours later and that's when you can spot Mars. Curiously, this month the red planet sits at the bottom of a vertical stack of three objects, with the star Castor on top, then brighter Pollux, and then even brighter Mars. Very eye-catching, don't you think? With the switch back to standard time, it'll start getting dark by 5 p.m., and there's plenty to see after nightfall. 
Look high up in the west, directly above the sunset point, and you'll see our old friends, the three bright stars of the summer triangle. Vega, at lower right, is the brightest. Deneb is above it by the width of two or three fists, and Altair is farther off to Vega's left. I suppose summer triangle is a misnomer because you'll be able to see this striking trio well into December. Turn to your left and look down below Saturn near the southern horizon. The only decently bright star in that part of the sky is Fomohaut. Now, it's got a weird spelling, and you might have heard it called Fomoho, but that's not being true to its Arabic roots. Depending on your latitude, Fomohaut is above the horizon by two or three fists. This lonely beacon is sometimes called the Autumn Star. It's part of the dim constellation known as Pisces Austrinus the southern fish. And in fact, in Arabic, its name means mouth of the fish. Around mid-November, look for Fomahot at 7 p.m. and note what's below it along your horizon. That direction is due south. If you do an about phase to look due north, you'll find Polaris, the north star, roughly halfway from the horizon to overhead. Don't expect to be dazzled by Polaris. It's only half as bright as Fomahot. About three-fifths to the upper right of Polaris, you'll see a group of five medium-bright stars crudely shaped like a three, or like a broad M tipped up on its right corner. This is the constellation Cassiopeia, who is a queen in Greek mythology. Now, you might imagine these stars outlining the chair or throne that she's sitting on rather than the queen herself. The somewhat dimmer stars of Cepheus, her husband, are just to the queen's left, they look a bit like an upside-down house. Ancient poets say that Cassiopeia was queen of either Ethiopia or Joppa, the city now called Jaffo in Israel. In any case, she was both beautiful and boastful. To punish the queen's arrogance, Poseidon, lord of the sea, unleashed a flood and sent the monster Cetus to ravage her land. The only way to stop it was to chain the royal couple's daughter, Andromeda, to a rock. Luckily, the hero Perseus was on his way home from having killed Medusa. He swoops in to save Andromeda, then claims her in marriage. Meanwhile, Cassiopeia's misdeeds landed her up in the sky, doomed to hang upside down half the time, and clinging to her throne so she doesn't fall off. In any case, all these mythological players are in the same part of the sky. For example, you can find the splash of medium-bright stars marking Perseus by starting at the three of Cassiopeia and looking two or three fists lower down. To the queen's right, by about two fists, is Andromeda. Go a little farther to the right, and closer to overhead, to spot the great square of the constellation Pegasus, the winged horse. In some tellings of Andromeda's rescue, Perseus is riding Pegasus. The dim stars of Cetus, the sea monster, are three or four fists down below the great square. November is the peak of three meteor showers. The southern torrids are a modest display that peaks on November 5th. A week later, the 12th, marks the peak of the northern torrids, also a weak shower, but this time with more interference from the waxing gibbous moon. What makes the torrids potentially exciting is that they are known to have a high proportion of bright fireballs. Occasionally, an extremely bright one makes the news. Also, the torrids strike our atmosphere at a relatively slow 19 miles per second. In effect, they're catching up with Earth from behind, which means that, unlike the case with most showers, they're most numerous in the evening. Then come the Leonids, peaking before dawn on the 17th. This shower's parent comet, Temple Tuttle, tends to create narrow, concentrated streams of debris that produced prodigious displays of shooting stars in the late 1990s, when the comet was last close to the sun. However, since then, this shower has offered little more than a trickle of shooting stars radiating from Leo's sickle. And with a nearly full moon sharing the sky, I wouldn't expect much of a show this year. Hey, thanks for letting me expand your celestial horizons for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this sky tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review. 
It'll help spread the word about SkyTour, and I really welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. SkyTour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and it's produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll officially welcome the King of Planets, Jupiter, to the evening sky. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>